good afternoon. I'm sorry if uh, you didn't hear me. Uh, so my name is Ahmed Kovacic. I'm professor at City University of London and uh, Royal Academy Chair uh, in Compressor Technology. And I'm honored to uh, be invited to uh, chair this webinar presented by uh, Dr. Sean Petley, which is on uh, best practices applied to turbo machinery. Uh, before I start uh, introducing Sean, uh, just a brief information that um, after the, uh, the presentation, we'll have a, a, a Q&A session and you can ask questions uh, in um, uh, ask the question box. Um, this event will also be recorded, recorded and uh, everyone will receive recordings within uh, seven days. Uh, uh, from the organizer. Uh, so now let me introduce Sean. Uh, Dr. Sean Petley is currently a research consultant at Robert Gordon University, working on industrial research related to multi-phase operation for the offshore oil industry. In addition, Sean has some teaching responsibilities at Lancaster University, supervising several student projects and running the introduction to CFD tutorials. Prior to, to this role, he worked as a research and development manager for a small hydropower company in Zurich, Switzerland. Sean obtained his PhD in 2018, sponsored by the hydro tur turbo, uh, turbine manufacturer Gilbert Geiks and Gordon, and uh, his research used multi-phase CFD to optimize the injector and the uh, uh, casing design of a Pelton turbine. So Sean, please go ahead with your presentation. Thank you very much, Ahmed, for that introduction. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Today, I'm very happy to talk to you about CFD best practices. And since this is a webinar delivered from the Fluid Machinery Group, which I'm a committee member, the focus of the talk will be applied to turbo machinery. As previously mentioned, I'm currently an engineering consultant working at Robert Gordon University in Aberdeen. And I have used CFD for a number of years applied to several turbo machinery applications, such as Pelton turbines, Kaplan turbines, and centrifugal pumps. So without further ado, let's get into the overview of the talk. Today, I will start with a brief introduction highlighting the context of this talk, followed by some in-depth discussion on the sources of errors and best practices, such as utilizing best practices for mesh generation and making appropriate modeling choices. I will then follow with a practical engineering case study, which my colleague, Dr. Nilla Carlson Davies at Lancaster University worked on for her PhD, which in this instance is a regenerative liquid ring pump. So why is this an important topic? We all know that the use of CFD in industry has been growing over the last few years, and many companies have made CFD an indispensable tool for their engineers. It now plays an important role in the design or analysis process, especially for turbo machinery, where experimental campaigns can be very expensive. Nowadays, both the largest companies and even very small SMEs will use some form of CFD analysis. And this has been fueled firstly by the decreasing costs of computer hardware and also the wide variety of different codes, indeed some open source codes, which don't have any associated licensing costs. And secondly, by the ability of these codes to simulate ever increasingly complex fluid flow phenomena. Nevertheless, CFD is a tool like any other, and it can be misused. I like to think of it like baking. If our ingredients are poorly measured or of poor quality, then the result will not be worth eating. Furthermore, in some circles, CFD is rather disparagingly known as color for directors. Because CFD can give us immediate results, it is often tempting to cut corners and miss out steps. This should be avoided. Nowadays, though, CFD codes are very robust and capable of giving us very accurate results. However, the human and computational effort required can lead to a trade-off between accuracy and time. Understanding the limitations of CFD and managing these errors is therefore vital to ensure successful and quality CFD simulations. 
So on this slide, I highlight five key areas that can affect the quality of our simulation. And as you can see, they are relevant at different stages of the simulation process. So every choice we make as modelers can have an effect on the results. And in order to develop trust and confidence in CFP, we need to understand, evaluate, and control the errors and uncertainty. This webinar will primarily focus on errors, which is defined by the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics as a recognizable deficiency in a CFD model that is not caused by lack of knowledge. It's important to note, however, that CFD models can also be affected by uncertainties, which are defined as potential deficiencies in a CFD model that is caused by a lack of knowledge, i.e. things which are out of our control. These can include cases where pre-existing information about flow, such as pressure and velocities, are not known, so we have to make guesses. As you can see in the slide, I've shown a general outline of the CFD process, which most of you will be familiar with. Quite an important first step, which is often overlooked, is to define your modeling goals. And a common question I'll ask my students is why have you chosen to use CFD? It's also important to look at the computational resources available to you and think about the time allocated to your project to try and plan out as best as possible the number of simulations required for a particular analysis problem, i.e. you may need multiple flow rates, multiple rotational speeds for both original and optimized geometry configurations, and try and best possible estimate the time required for this. Then, of course, in the next steps, we have to understand the fundamental fluid dynamics of the problem. Questions such as, what is the level of turbulence in my simulation? Am I modeling multiple phases? And how do they react with one another? The next four boxes form the heart of the CFT simulation, and the final three relate to data collection, analysis, and documentation. As you can see, for each of these boxes, there are subcategories, which relate to questions that you as engineers have to ask to determine what is important to capture and also recognize that each choice we make could introduce errors, and we should ensure that we keep them under control. Now, I don't claim to be a mathematician, but I think it's useful and perhaps interesting to discuss briefly what the CFD solver is doing. To obtain fluid dynamics outputs of interest, we need to determine the flow field past, or in some cases, through structures. This requires the solving of the Navier-Stokes equation, However, in the vast majority of cases, there is no analytical solution. Therefore, the Navier-Stokes equations are solved numerically using a CFD code solving the governing equations discreetly on a mesh. In most CFD solvers, finite volume methods can be used to approximate the continuous derivatives of a partial differential equation. The finite volume equation is then solved numerically using iterative methods yielding approximate solutions to partial differential equation. Let's look at this very simple example of the numerical schemes used to solve partial differential equations. On this slide is the simplest central finite difference approximation, and if we take the first partial derivative of u, we result in the two equations for ux and uy. In this case, big O denotes the truncation error which is defined as the error that results from using an approximation in place of an exact mathematical procedure. Here, P denotes the order of accuracy. Most typical CFD codes will offer both first order and second order accuracy of the discretization methods. So in summary, if we increase the size of our discretization and use lower order methods, the truncation errors will increase. So let's bear that in mind when we consider the next few slides. So let's first talk a little bit about numerical errors, which are related to the mesh discretization. Meshing turbo machinery geometry for CFD simulations is considered to be one of the most challenging and complex tasks in the CFD community. It can be incredibly time consuming, and in some cases take weeks of effort to construct a good mesh. 
there are a large variety of mesh generation tools that give varying levels of human control. CAD-based ones such as PointWise, ISIN, ANSYS Mesh, and G-Mesh, or automated cut cell meshes such as Snappy Hex Mesh, ScanIP, and Harpoon. Each of these has a varying level of complexity. ISIM, for example, is very good if we want to create structured meshes with complex flow paths, since we can use blocking to break up the geometry and create associations between edges and curves. However, it is not particularly novice friendly. Other meshing tools, such as fluent meshing, allow a great deal of automated flexibility, but can give a false sense of security because of their ease of use. So when we talk about a mesh, what do we mean? Put simply, mesh generation is the process of discretization or dividing the fluid domain into smaller volumes made up of hexahedral, tetrahedral, polyhedral, and prism-shaped elements. Here I'm talking about three-dimensional meshes only. So the first step is to determine the choice of mesh type. And as I mentioned, there are a wide variety of meshing tools and some are more suited to different geometry types. However, it is generally agreed that for highly accurate fluid flow analysis, a high quality structured mesh is required to simulate the flow path. Structured hexahedral meshes are therefore preferred over unstructured tetrahedral meshes for the following reasons. Hexahedral cells are essentially cuboids whereas tetrahedral cells are triangular pyramids. Now it can take five tetrahedral cells to fill a hexahedron with relatively similar edge lengths, as we can see on the slide. The result is that using hexahedral cells is a much more efficient way of dividing up the space, requiring a lower cell count needed to resolve the geometry, and therefore we can reduce our simulation time, because put simply, the more cells, the longer it takes to run the simulation. The second advantage comes when we analyze the mesh quality. We often examine two key metrics, orthogonality and skewness, whereby any distortion from the perfect hexahedral cell increases the skewness and reduces the orthogonality, and in both cases, reduces the quality. In addition, hexahedral cell coordinates can easily be transformed into the calculation matrix part of the numerical technique of the solver. However, with tetrahedral meshes, there is a need for a transformation matrix to map those coordinates onto the calculation matrix. During the, CP, uh, during the simulation, the CPU has to read out the transformation matrix for each time step, therefore increasing the simulation time. Hexahedral cells also provide high accuracy. Very often, flows are unidirectional, and since in most turbo machinery applications, we are very often interested in boundary layer flows, such as around an aerofoil, it is therefore physically sensible to mesh uh, faces uh, that follow the flow direction, which is achieved by the lateral faces of hexahedra, while tetrahedra will necessarily have faces that cross the flow. We can also maintain orthogonal meshes in the wall normal direction using hexahedra. So let's take a look at four very simple examples. Here a fluid with two different velocities is simulated moving linearly through the mesh. The first two examples show cases with structured meshes and cell faces aligned with the flow. The contour plots show a very well defined interface between the two using first order methods. In the next two examples, we see an unstructured mesh and a structured mesh, both misaligned with the flow. And in these two examples, the interface is very diffuse, indicating a high level of inaccuracy, which is only moderately improved using second order methods. So in summary, a structured hexahedral mesh provides lower cell count and reduces the numerical error if the mesh is aligned with the flow. So, after CAD cleanup, feasibility of creating a structured hexahedral mesh for the geometry should be studied. In most cases, however, a hybrid mesh is generated with a combination of hexahedral and tetrahedral cells.
So it is really advisable to check the literature available for your particular turbo machinery problem, study what, what sort of mesh gives the most accurate results, and the types of meshing tools that were used to achieve it. So a common question is, well, just how fine should my mesh be? And this usually starts at the walls. In most CFT solvers, the wall adjacent cell uses a special modeling technique to ensure that the wall shear stress and the boundary layer profile is computed correctly. They do this by adopting a model for how the velocity profile behaves between the wall, or between the cell centroid and the wall. What we can see on, in the diagram on the left is the black line shows experimental measurements, how the velocity profile varies when we are close to the wall. And the blue and the green lines show the two models, modern CFD codes, used to capture this behavior in the wall adjacent cell. Normally, we can target a Y plus value less than five. And as you can see from the diagram, if our Y plus value is less than five, then the black curve follows the blue curve. Whereas if the, we target a Y plus value between 30 and 200, then we place our cell in the log law reading shown on the right. Here, CFT code uses the green curve to model the observed behavior shown in black. Therefore, what we are doing when we construct our mesh is to try and place our Y plus value in the viscous sublayer less than five, or in the log law region between 30 and 200. The reason we do this is to ensure that the solution is accurate. We may still be able to achieve a converged solution where a Y plus value lies outside this range. However, we want to ensure that the solution we compute is accurate and follows real life. And to do this, we should place some stringent restrictions on the Y plus value that we target when we go for our CFD simulation. So what is Y plus? On this slide, I have shown the formula for Y plus in the top equation. And as we can see, terms include the dimensionless distance of the cell centroid from the nearest wall, YP. Rho is the fluid density. Mu is the kinematic viscosity of the fluid. And U tau is the friction velocity, which is given by the square root of the wall shear stress. And this is a measure of the effective velocity in that cell. If we rearrange this formula for YP, we can work out the first layer height based on a desired value of Y plus. However, the problem with this formula is that in most cases, we don't initially know the value of the wall shear stress because we haven't computed our CFT simulation. One way to overcome this is to consider the wall as a flat plate boundary, since for this example, there is a wealth of empirical data available for this very simple flow scenario. And from this very simple model, we can work out our wall shear stress. Now, for the purposes of this talk, I'm excluding some steps. But on the left-hand side of the screen, there is a screen capture of one of the many online calculators that may enable us to estimate the first layer height based on the principle I've just described. And most of these will have the accompanying literature for you to read. Now, you may, of course, be thinking, well, the characteristic length and flow velocity will not be constant throughout the mesh. Therefore, we should choose carefully where we consider our representative length scale and velocity. And usually, we try and place these in areas where we care about accuracy and want to fully resolve the turbulent effects, such as areas with flow separation, high pressure gradients, or shocks. So now we have our initial mesh, we can run the simulation and extract the Y plus values from the CFT post processor. If they are too large or the boundary layer has not been adequately captured, then we should go back and refine the mesh and run the simulation again and check those values. Now it has to be said that a proper Y plus check is never really applied in reality, as this would need to be done at all flow rates. And if we needed to try this for several different designs, then the time scales would soon become unmanageable. However, one way we can manage this is to specify the Y plus value for the highest RPM or highest flow scenario, as in these cases, the boundary layer will be at its thinnest and the Y plus value will be largest. As we drop the speed, the boundary layer thickens and the Y plus value will therefore reduce, improving the solution accuracy. Of course, it goes without saying that as we refine our mesh to improve the Y plus value, 
and the overall number of cells in the mesh will increase along with the simulation time. So judging mesh size is really down to engineering judgment. So a good way to judge discretization errors is to carry out a mesh refinement study. Since the errors here are the difference between a solution on an infinitely fine grid and a finite width mesh. As you can see in the slide, the mesh has been refined twice using a ratio, where all the cell edge lengths are reduced by that ratio, excluding the boundary layer. Quantities such as head rise or efficiency can then be used to compare the converged solutions from the three meshes, and a mathematical technique called a Richardson extrapolation can then be used to work out the quantity at zero grid spacing. And this will determine if our chosen meshes are mesh independent. Another alternative to globally refining the mesh is to use mesh adaption, which has been available in many solvers for quite a long time now. Most mesh adaption techniques use the CFD simulation procedure itself, whereby it improves the mesh to reduce the discretization error for the flow at hand. In the first step, the adaptation algorithm estimates truncation errors, for example, by examining local gradients of the flow variables. Then they enrich the mesh in areas of the highest gradients, hoping to reduce discretization errors and to determine the ideal, ideal mesh for the simulation problem. Mesh adaption, if used correctly, can save a lot of time. But since it works on a divide and conquer approach to enrich the mesh, whereby an existing cell locally divided into additional cells, the mesh quality can actually decrease when locally refining the mesh. Furthermore, some algorithms will adapt the mesh face leading to distortions of the original geometry, resulting in a perfect mesh or an improper geometry. Another source of numerical errors is related to the numerical stability. As I previously mentioned, CFT solvers use an iterative process to solve the governing equations. And we as engineers have to make judgments about the numerical stability and how many iterations are required by monitoring the solution convergence. We usually start from an initial approximation to the flow solution and iterate to a final result. This should ideally satisfy the imposed boundary conditions and the equations in each mesh cell and globally over the whole domain. But if the iterative process is incomplete, then errors arise. In short, error, convergence errors arise because we are impatient or short of time, or the numerical methods are inadequate and do not allow the solution algorithm to complete its process for the final converged solution. Judging convergence is complicated since there is no universally accepted criteria, and mathematicians have found no formal proof that a converged solution for the Navier Stokes equation exists. In some situations, the iterative procedure does not converge but either diverges or remains at a fixed and unacceptable level of error, or oscillates between alternative solutions. Careful selection and optimization of control parameters, such as damping and relaxation factors, or the size of time steps, may be needed in these cases to ensure that a converged solution can be found. That being said, the level of convergence is most commonly evaluated based on residuals. Residuals are 3D fields associated with a conservation law, such as conservation of mass or momentum. They indicate how far the present approximate solution is away from perfect conservation, i.e. the balance of fluxes. In principle, a solution is converged if the desired level of round-off error is reached. It's important also to note how the solver calculates these residuals, as some will normalize the values, making textbook suggestions such as 10 to the power minus 4 for the continuity equation meaningless. Typical output from a CFD solver is shown on the left, where the vertical spikes indicate a new time step. And in each time step, the residual value is reduced by at least two orders of magnitude through convergence. Usually, however, it is far more useful to monitor a globally integrated parameter, such as wall forces, i.e. 
pressure moments lift or drag as the simulation progresses. We do this by placing a monitor point, which can be the coordinates of a single cell or the average value across a face or boundary at arbitrarily chosen locations in the flow domain. For transient analyses, which the vast majority of Tova machinery problems are, one condition we must ensure for stability and to ensure convergence is the current or CFL number. The physical explanation of the CFL number is related to the distance u delta t, the flow moves for a cell delta x within a time step period delta t. And to ensure that we meet these stability conditions, then it's ideal to have a CFL number less than one. This is strictly true if we're using an explicit solver, which is conditionally stable. However, if we're using an implicit formulation, then there are no strict CFL conditions. However, we still need to use a time step size that will physically represent the system and ensure we allow the solver to converge each iteration. And in most cases, this will be significantly more than if we were using the explicit solver, since the solver is inherently more stable. As you can see through, uh, see with the plot on the right, um, changing the CFL numbers will dramatically affect the rate of convergence. And while the residual value can decrease much faster using higher CFL numbers, it may be unstable and giving us unrealistic results. Therefore, the choice of whether an implicit versus explicit method um, is a, whether it should be used ultimately depends on the goal of the computation. When time dependent accuracy is important, explicit methods produce greater accuracy with less computational efforts than implicit methods. Model errors can be defined as the difference between the actual flow and the mathematical flow model we're using. And the most common source of model error is the incorrect description of the flow specifically related to turbulence. Turbulence, as we know, introduces unsteadiness into the flow field, and therefore most flows of interest in turbulent machinery are predominantly turbulent. The nature of turbulence is such that it introduces a wide range of length and time scales, and the higher the Reynolds number, the greater the range. So while the equations could be directly integrated for low Reynolds number flows, at more practical Reynolds number, this becomes practically impossible, even with the largest computers over very long time scales. This approach is known as direct numerical simulation, DNS, and is only pursued in a well-equipped research environment for very special cases. The most common and practical approach to dealing with turbulence is known as Reynolds averaging. Constantly, we will often see the terms Rand's equations, which stands for Reynolds Average Navier-Stokes Equations. In this process, the instantaneous quantities such as pressure and velocity are decomposed into time average and fluctuating components. By this process, all turbulent structures are eliminated from the flow and a smooth variation of the average velocity and pressure fields can be obtained. However, the averaging process introduces unknown additional terms into the transport equation called Reynolds stresses and fluxes that need to be provided by suitable turbulence models. The most common variants are zero order models, which provide an algebraic relationship between the turbulence and the mean flow, two equation models, which provide two transport equations to characterize the turbulence. Examples include the k-epsilon, k-omega, and shear stress transport, or SST models, and the Reynolds stress model, which provide transport equations for all six Reynolds stresses, as well as equations for the scalar fluxes. There are many additional variants, but the list I've just given you provides the main landscape. All contain various levels of approximation and empiricism. Unfortunately, it is generally acknowledged that there is no one-size-fits-all turbulence model for every application, and therefore it is advised to check the solver guidelines as to which turbulence model is better suited for the salient features you expect to see in the flow. Cursory mention of the large eddy simulation or LES approach is required. Again, there are many variants 
with some that blend LES and RANS approaches. This approach chooses to simulate the large scales while modeling the smaller scales. LES is more computationally intensive and therefore more time consuming to use. And it's often beneficial, and it is really only beneficial for certain classes of flows, particularly those that are very unsteady and not dominated by boundary lags. A good example is the combustion flow in a gas turbine combustor. Use of LES is likely to grow as the models are refined and validated and computing power grows. And it goes without saying that turbulence modeling remains one of the biggest areas of CFD research. The most turbine machinery applications will adopt one of the two equation models. And while it is the aim of any simulation that the converged solution should be independent of the initial values of K and omega or K and epsilon, we should try and where possible to use reasonable guesses for K and omega uh, or epsilon in order to get better convergence and speed up this process. Furthermore, it is especially important that we start with a suitable state turbulence when we're using wire plus insensitive wall treatments. For complex flows, we can specify these initial conditions in terms of turbulent intensity and turbulent viscosity ratio. There are then formulas to allow us to estimate the value of K, turbulent kinetic energy, from the computed turbulent intensity and the characteristic mean velocity magnitude of the simulation. Likewise, we can specify an initial guess for epsilon or omega that the resulting eddy viscosity is sufficiently large in comparison to the molecular viscosity. On this slide, I've also plotted a graph highlighting the boundary layer prediction for a NACA 4412 aerofoil with different turbulence models plotted against experimental data. The graph comes from the work of Dr. Florio Mentor, who is a pioneer in the work of uh, turbulence research, particularly on the SST model. The SST model is a hybrid two equation model that combines the advantages of both K epsilon and K omega, since K omega model performs much better than K epsilon models for boundary layer flows, while the K omega model is overly sensitive to the free stream value of omega, while the K epsilon model is not prone to such problems. So it's certainly been my experience that for most turbo machinery problems, the best practice is to use the most appropriate two equation RANS model, perhaps with some additions or transition. And as far as I've seen, the SST model is the standard and most generally recommended. Since this is a turbo machinery seminar, it would be remiss of me to not talk about how we model rotation. And these can be broken down into two categories, and their main difference is based on our frame of reference. On the left, the frozen rotor, which is a steady state approximation. This is based on the multiple reference frame methodology, whereby the equations and motion are solved in the rotating reference frame, such that we represent problems that are unsteady in the stationary frame, steady with respect to the moving frame. While the case on the right, um, with the sliding mesh approach, here we take into account the rotation of the rotor mesh by explicitly rotating a physical region within the domain by a certain angle in each time step. Of course, this links back to the previous slide where we were talking about accuracy and stability and how much rotation we want to model in each time step is our control variable in our sensitivity analysis. The third option is called mixing plane, which is more suited for situations where a sliding mesh approach would be unfeasibly time consuming, such as when the number of blades is different for each blade row, and therefore a large number of blade passages are required in order to maintain circumferential periodicity, such as that in a multi-stage turbine. In this case, the simulation is treated as steady and the circumferential data is averaged or mixed at the interface. The decision to choose either of these approaches is not so straightforward. And again, it comes down to a case of engineering judgment of which the key criteria would be 
what is it that we want to model. Certainly, if we want to take into account cases where rotor stator interaction is strong, i.e. in part load, high load, off design conditions, where the upstream or downstream flows have a strong influence on the performance of the machine, then it is almost certain that the unsteady sliding mesh approach will be required. However, at best efficiency, efficiency conditions, where the flow is at its most steady, then a frozen rotor assumption may be accurate enough to represent the flow path. So to summarize everything we have discussed so far, errors can arise in our simulations from a number of sources. Chiefly, however, those that we should pay most attention to are discretization errors related to poor mesh resolution, numerical errors related to the stability and convergence of our simulation, and choices such as turbulence modeling that may smooth out some of the features of the flow. So now I want to focus a little bit more on a specific case study where CFD best practices have been applied and an effort to quantify the errors has been carried out. This case study I will look at is for a regenerative liquid ring pump, RLR pump. Perhaps what really distinguishes the RLR pump is its ability to develop high head at relatively low flow rates in only one impeller stage. And in contrast to the centrifugal pump, for example, the pressure rise occurs in the peripheral rather than in the radial direction. The RLR pump requires tight clearances around the impeller to ensure optimum head and efficiency performance. However, these clearances can be affected by operational wear of internal components over time. So the purpose of this project was to analyze the pump performance with clearances determined by the manufacturing tolerances and altered clearances that are the result of wear. In this project, both new and damaged pumps were tested experimentally and were then measured using point probes so the CAD geometry could be constructed accordingly. Contrary to typical turbo machines such as centrifugal pumps, the RLR pump does not have any symmetry or periodicity, and therefore the full fluid region incorporating all the major flow paths, suction, discharge, side channel, impeller, and clearances have to be modeled. However, there are some simplifications that can be made. It's at this point that we introduce the concept of systematic errors, which result from sources such as geometry simplification or emission and truncation of the extent of the term turbo machine simulated. So we have to be careful that during our CAD cleanup, we are not removing too much detail that could fundamentally change the flow. The particular design of RLR pump using this research features a side channel on either side of the impeller. The side channel ring is broken by a port plate to limit the available flow leakage path. For the drive end side of the pump, the port plate is a separate part of the casing, as can be seen in the figure at the top left hand corner of the screen. So when we extracted the fluid region, small and complex geometrical shapes are created when the interfaces are not fully lining up which is very difficult for the solver to understand. But in order to avoid this, the port plate was incorporated into the drive body in a similar manner as on the non-driving body. Furthermore, the outlets and inlets uh, were extended by five diameters upstream and downstream. This was to allow the flow field to fully develop before it enters the impeller and to avoid recirculation at the outlets. Now, due to the complexity of the pump geometry, care was taken um, with regards to the distribution of the mesh cells in the model. The larger cell size in the suction and discharge pipes is acceptable, as the regions that are of critical importance are the axial and radial clearance surrounding the impeller. Owing to the complexity of the geometry and the available meshing tools at the time, um, we were only able to create an unstructured tetrahedral mesh in the impeller and inlet and outlet zones. However, the pipes were um, structurally meshed with hexahedral elements. The axial and radial clearances around the impeller are very small, often less than 0.5 millimeter. Therefore, it was essential to be able to capture the behavior of the flow at these points of interest. 
As the thickness can be different for the drive end, non drive end, and radial clearances, a set cell size 0.04 mm was used to distribute the cells equally within each clearance. The overall mesh design was improved further by ensuring that the cell size on each side of the domain interfaces were matched to warrant smooth transition of the flow across the interfaces. In terms of boundary conditions, total pressure was assumed to be atmospheric at the inlet and a desired mass flow rate was set on the outlet. So in this slide, we look at the time discretization and initially a uh, time step size was chosen that was physically um, equivalent to a convenient angle of rotation, in this case blade spacing, i.e. 0.1125 degrees of rotation corresponding to a delta t of 8.15 times 10 to the minus 6 seconds. The time step size was then increased in increments of 50% to 6.52 times 10 to the minus 5 seconds, corresponding to 0.9 degrees. The normalized pressure differences in the transient average pressure for the time step study is shown in the table. The pressure pulsations follow the same trend, but are more pronounced for the smaller time steps. And despite the drop in normalized pressure between the smallest and uh, largest time step being relatively large, 2.1%, it was decided that we would um, go with a time step of 0.45 degrees of rotation because there was only a difference of 0.5% in the normalized pressure, but it sold 81 hours shorter than the um, finest time step. Furthermore, the Solver Modeling Guide describes a residual target of 10 to the power minus 4 as being sufficient for most engineering applications. In order to investigate this, two simulations will run with a residual target of 10 to the power minus 4 and minus 5. The time step was set to a conservative target of 0.1125 degrees per time step, giving a current number of around 0.6. Taking a look at the results where you can see for a higher level of convergence, we have an almost, well, we have an over, over double increase in time taken to run the simulation. But with only a 0.68% difference in the normalized pressure, it was decided that converging to 10 to the power of minus four was sufficient for this set of simulations. Here we present the results of the mesh refinement study, and in this case the mesh was homogeneously refined each time by a ratio of 1.5. But as I, pre, as, I um, sh as should be pointed out, special care and attention was taken to ensure how many cells were placed in the small clearances. In this study, the coarse mesh contained 7.2 million cells, and the finest mesh contained 40. 0.7 million cells. The results are plotted in the figure on the left, and the discretization error is estimated with a grid convergence index. This is a widely adopted approach, and the details of which can be found widely in the literature and online references. So as the mesh spacing is reduced, the model pressure approaches the asymptotic zero mesh spacing value. And once the order of convergence is obtained, the average pressure at zero mesh spacing can be determined using the Richardson extrapolation of the two finest meshes. This gives a zero mesh spacing average pressure of 102.48%. The figure on the right shows the pressure fluctuations across the pump for each mesh analyzed in the refinement study. And despite the fact that 0.45 degree rotation of the impeller per time step was shown to produce accurate, accurate results as we previously discussed. Meshes with smaller time steps require, uh, with smaller cells require smaller time steps. Therefore, the time steps fixed for each simulation a value of 0.225 degrees, providing a good compromise between accuracy and computational cost. 
Despite a 2.5 percentage difference between the course and the fine result, it was considered necessary to choose the course mesh in order to balance time and accuracy of the subsequent parametric analysis, which included over 50 runs. As you can see in the table at the bottom there, even with the courses grid to run to full convergent, which is six impeller revolution, with the available computational resources that we had, it still takes two days, five hours. Final check that we did was to look at different turbulence models and how they apply to the RLR pump. And in this case, all we have done is uh, look at four different two equation models. The K-omega turbulence model was also looked at, but it, since it gives identical to the results for the K-omega SST model, it was not presented here. In this application, the K-omega SST model provided results closest to the true experimental value. So although there are some differences between the three, the differences are quite minor, and the time taken to solve each of these is roughly the same. So as I said before, k ST is usually adopted, and it's quite a good option in this case. So in summary then, what have we learnt? In most cases, the most significant source of error, as was in this uh, set of simulations, will be related to the mesh. However, with sensible meshing, errors can be quantified and controlled to single digits with dramatic reductions in the simulation time. For most turbo machinery applications, ensuring we keep the current number low will avoid any doubts regarding numerical instability and the errors become negligible. Likewise, by keeping a grip on the residuals, we can assess the solution convergence. And as I said earlier, it should be pointed out that for true periodic behavior to be observed, it was necessary to run the simulation for six impeller revolutions. So in conclusion, CFD is complex and requires a great deal of attention to user control. But when we respect the physics, it can provide us with very accurate results for a range of fluid flow problems. Before we start any project, it really helps to define our goals and plan accordingly. Acknowledging that there will always be a trade-off between accuracy and time um, is important, but we can balance this by setting suitable error margins. And a point that I haven't really covered in this talk is that most CFD software have very good add-ons for parametric analysis, and many have planning tools so we can keep track of the generated data. It's also helpful to read the scientific literature to know the current state of the art applied to a particular problem. This can save us time having to try different settings and numerical methods. When it comes to meshing, it really is location, location, location. And it's really beneficial that we learn several meshing tools to ensure that we generate the best quality mesh for every application. Likewise, scrutinizing the residuals and monitor points can tell us how our simulation is behaving. Finally, in the best case scenario, it's always great if we can have experimental validation. Sometimes this may not be available to us uh, exactly, but there may be um, data available in the literature that we can use to benchmark our models against. So where possible, it's always best to have some kind of indication of real-world experimental experience. So thank you very much for your time. I hope you found that interesting and enjoyable. And now I would welcome your questions. Thank you very much, Sean, for uh, your very interesting presentation, most interesting and uh, uh, very relevant. Uh, I really enjoyed listening to it.
Uh, we have a, a fair number of questions, uh, and uh, we have about 10 minutes to answer to them. Uh, so let's go to, through some of these questions, and in case we don't manage to answer all of them, uh, I'm sure that uh, Sean will be happy to <coughs> respond to these questions by email uh, to you. Now, the first question here is, uh, uh, what, what are the acronyms that you have used in uh, your presentation, like uh, RANS, SRS, and DNS? Um, hello there. So um, the RANS just simply stands for the Reynolds Average Navier-Stokes Equations. SRS is Scale Resolving Simulation. And DNS is direct numerical simulation. So we're increasing in complexity from RANS to SRS to DNS. And as I mentioned, DNS is sort of the holy grail, if you like. It's it's the full uh, resolving of all of the turbulent length and velocity scales. So it's really a very specialised uh, modelling technique used in very small cases. Uh, where the geometry is very small and obviously it takes a huge amount of computational time and is very resource intensive. So, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Okay, the next question that we have is uh, um, any suggestion, a suggestion about modeling of separation flow uh, in uh, wind turbine blades? I guess. Uh, Obviously, wind turbines, we are talking here about uh, compressible fluids and in pumps that you are doing, it's mostly uh, incompressible fluids that you are dealing with. Uh, but actually, there was a series of questions related to the separation flows and uh, this issue. So do you have any suggestion about modeling separation flows in wind turbine blades? Yeah, so obviously separation is, um, you know, an important uh, area to capture since it's generally where we we lose a lot of our performance. So we really want to try and model separation as um, accurately as possible. Um, obviously, because our boundary layer is no longer uh, uniform, no longer following the um, experimental shape that we would get with wall functions we can't use wall functions in those areas so we really have to resolve down to the very uh, small mesh cells y plus of one um, so really of course we could choose uh, y plus of one around that area but then it's really important to perhaps look at further refining the grids at the point where we expect to see separation Another point to consider is the growth ratio away, away, away from the wall, because obviously the smaller the cells we choose at the wall, the, the larger our aspect ratio will become, so the quality of the mesh can actually decrease. So it's important to check the cell size around the point of separation and also make sure that our growth rate is not too large so that we're not moving from really small cells at the wall to much, much larger cells as we move away from the wall. So, mm. yeah, wall, wall functions are not applicable there, and really we need to resolve right down to the boundary layer for closed separated regions. And in that case, of course, we are talking about hexahedral meshes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next question is related to best practices or best uh, uh, yeah, best practices in using adaptive meshing to adapt the mesh if we don't know the discontinuity location. Yeah, I mean, this, this of course, is, is the big thing. And it's, it's really important that we take care and attention when we are actually using mesh adaption. Because as I can say, it, it, it's really a useful approach in that uh, we can refine cells in the area of interest. But again, it, it's difficult when we don't always know the area of interest. So um, mesh adaption really only works once we have some sort of solution 
already um, already processed. So typically, you would run run a, a solution, look at um, look at say gradients of velocity or velo of pressure, for example, and then you would use those gradients as points as to where uh, to adapt the mesh. And most CFD solvers now have automatic mesh adaption, so they would um, refine cells in an area of interest. And there's quite a lot of flexibility in terms of uh, where you can, uh, what parameters you can choose to refine by. But um, yeah, in some cases, of course, it's it's going to refine cells around walls, for it, for example, and that may or may not be good because it can actually distort the mesh locally. So um, yeah, it's it's really key to just make sure when you're using mesh adaption, you, you take care and attention that it's actually benefiting the solution rather than detracting from the solution. Okay, thank you. Uh, there are actually several questions coming uh, in which are related to recommended uh, type of, of meshes. One of them is uh, what type of meshing technique would you recommend for very thin trust funds? Uh, say, say that again. Uh, so it says uh, here, what type of meshing techniques would you recommend for very thin trust funds? Trust funds. Well, again, again, it's it's. Um, I, I'm not totally familiar with trust funds, but uh, it's um, of course checking exactly what it is you want to model and just following the steps. So, um, hmm. as I say, these can apply quite generally as best practices, but um, I'm not totally familiar with that type of um, machine. So it's it depends what your your modeling objectives are. Yes, 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 absolutely. In many cases, it could be hexahedral and uh, tetrahedral or other meshes. But there is a similar, uh, not similar, but uh, in, in the same line question, uh, which asks, uh, uh, do you see the rotating machines can only be modeled properly with body fitted meshes or grids? Uh, but is there an opportunity for non body fitted approaches? Like for example, uh, cut Cartesian meshes or similar. Yeah, and that's definitely something that's that's growing. Um, as solvers improve, we we're always looking at of new ways for um, uh, improving uh, our meshing, and obviously how we do that is important. Uh, certainly, once we move towards really solving full full geometries and requiring the full resolution of large, large problems, then we need to think about how we mesh and uh, what we can do there to save some computational time. So I, I guess that doesn't really answer your question fully, but um, yeah, I certainly see it as an area that would be requiring more research and we'll be looking into that. Um, okay, a uh, couple more questions which are not related perhaps to meshing, but uh, uh, to physics and numerical solution of that physics. Um, how do parameters other than velocity, such as temperature and wall roughness, affect the first cell height and Y plus value? Yeah, so uh, definitely, um, obviously, the wall roughness will change uh, the how the boundary layer interacts. Obviously, what we've been talking about is purely a smooth flat plate. So yeah, the boundary layer will change. Um, and again, it's it's obviously we would like to put our first cell height within, uh, oh, sorry, excuse me, we would like to put our um, roughness within our first cell height. So it really, it really depends on how rough the surface is and how much that would change the mesh. But um, Obviously, all the solvers have uh, inbuilt functions that can account for wall roughness. And if you're using wall functions, then there are additional parameters which are added in to, um, into the solution to account for wall roughness. Um, so 
yeah, obviously, again, it goes back to just following the process that we assume a flat plate, run a solution for that, and then check it against um, any experimental data that we have for our problem with roughness applied. And if it's if it's not accurate enough, then we need to refine further. But generally speaking, if the roughness is below a certain percentage, the smooth wall approximation, when it comes to generating our mesh is sufficient enough. Thank you. And uh, maybe two more questions. There are several more, and I'm sure that you can answer to them uh, by email. But uh, two more yeah. questions. One is, uh, uh, obviously, you are modeling the pumps in here, uh, so non-compressible yeah. non, uh, uh, non fluids. But there was a question is, what is your experience in the errors in CFD when modeling heat transfer of turbo machinery? Yeah, again, that's a different one. Um, uh, to be perfectly honest, like, like you say, I've not done a huge amount of, of work with uh, heat transfer, but uh, that's a, a question I'm more than happy to discuss via email uh, with that particular person. I think it would, uh, it would be good, and uh, uh, thank you. And then uh, a last question is, uh, can you recommend a su suitable text for further, further self-study in this topic? Um, Yes, I mean, to be perfectly honest, a lot of the solver guides have very good guides and have very good um, theory guides as well. So I think these are a great place to start, certainly um, with regards to setting up models in the, in the relevant solvers. They, they have very good sort of step-by-step -step procedures. I think nowadays, I mean, we're, we're watching this medium over video and... To be honest, I have learned an awful lot from watching YouTube videos of various people who have uh, given lectures or give talks around uh, CFD and other fluid machinery problems. So but there's a, a very good channel on uh, YouTube called, um, I think it's called Fluid Mechanics 101. And that that's, gives a very good overview of various different CFD topics. Certainly, and, and uh, probably also to recommend CFD Online, where there are a lot of forums and where Absolutely. questions could be, could be posted and basically particular things could be learned from that. And uh, as, you, as you mentioned at the beginning also, um, uh, uh, user guides are very good of, of CFD solvers, but they also have a lot of tutorial cases, which might be in many cases similar to what people are trying to solve, and this could give a good good idea. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it, if it's not, even if it's not the perfect case, it gives sort of an understanding of well, these are the best um, best practices to follow, or these are the sort of settings that I'll be looking at using if I was going for a particular case study. Absolutely. Sean, thank you very much for, uh, you know, this presentation, which obviously triggered a lot of uh, very interesting questions, <laughs> uh, which demonstrates that the topic is interesting and that the presentations were, presentation was very informative and interesting. And I would like to thank you on behalf of uh, I'm a key and myself for, uh, you know, presenting that, uh, presenting that to us. And... Uh, and I would like uh, also to remind everyone that uh, basically this will be this is recorded, and uh, you will uh, receive recordings uh, uh, within the next seven days if you have missed something, and then Sean will try to answer to the remaining questions which uh, stay in here. Uh, with this, I would like to conclude this webinar and thank you very much for your time to join us this afternoon. Goodbye.